Hello and welcome to our 10 years anniversary series for HPC Systems, the big data open source platform. And this case, we have now Richard Chapman. And uh, of course, he needs no introduction. He's been the soul and the core of HPC Systems, both uh, since its inception back in year 2000 and throughout all of its open source life. And one of the uh, big open source advocates uh, in the entire team. So um, I invited Richard to join me today to have a little chat about the past 10 years, uh, ATO, of course, <laughs> which has been just released, and um, and what's coming down the road. So hello, Richard, and welcome. Thank you. So Richard, um, le le I'll take you a little bit beyond the 10 years, even though I said 10 years, and and Tell me a little bit on about the how HP Systems came to be. What was the original idea, and and and, and how, 20 years ago, um, this small group of people decided that there was a possibility of doing something better than what we had before. Um, well, what we had before was um, using very big hardware for the day, you know, um, 26 core Sun machines. Um, terabyte uh, EMC disk stacks, um, which were you know a million dollars a piece in at the time, um, and uh, using those to I mean, most of what we did to data in those days, and and the core of what we do to data today, revolves around sorting, um, and we were basically trying to sort data as quickly as possible using. The best hardware that was available at the time um, and it wasn't fast enough and it wasn't cheap enough uh, so uh, we decided if we could get lots of cheaper machines to work together on the problem then a um, the limit to scalability would be removed because you can just buy more of them whereas you you can't buy a, a bigger sunbox than the one we were buying at the time um, and the um, you know the, the the price was better uh, because we could use the uh, the storage on each node um, to store our data. It was a lot cheaper than the um, the EMC uh, uh, masses uh, at the time, um, and uh, it was a win-win provided that we could get you know, two hundred or four hundred or however many it was at the time. Uh, machines to cooperate on sorting the data. Um, it was something that hadn't really been uh, done at the time, um, you know, but we thought we could do it. Um, it. It's rather more commonplace these days to get uh, clusters of machines working together, but uh, when, when we were doing it, it was uh, when we were first doing it, it was a, uh, wasn't something that. Uh, uh, we'd seen done before, certainly. So we had to uh, invent new, new sorting techniques. We had to um, in create frameworks for getting the machines to talk together. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean that that was the the birth of HPCC. Uh, it wasn't really called HPCC in those days, but uh, uh, but that's how it came about. That is disruptive innovation. So you did manage to network eight connection machines in allusion to Jurassic Park. <laughs> Very good. That's a so. Um, I, but let's uh, speed up now a little bit and uh, and go all the way to twenty around twenty ten when we decided to make it open source. Um, so that of course was far easier, right? Because all it took was to just make the source code available, or didn't. <laughs> um, well, there were there were technical challenges to making it open source. There were political challenges to making it open source. We had to uh, sell the idea to the uh, uh, to the Reed Elsevier board that you know th this technology that we'd been you know, telling them for ten years was our uh, competitive edge, was our secret source, was what uh, uh, you know they'd paid a billion dollars to size in to acquire. Um, we were now going to just give away to anyone, and and they they uh, their initial reaction was, are, are you crazy? I think, but uh, we we um, we thought that actually 
the the technology the technical edge we had was not just in the technology but in knowing how to use it uh, it was not just in the HPCC platform but in all of the code we we had uh, created you know, using it in, in ECL um, and that the benefits of uh, sharing the HPCC technology uh, with the world um, would actually you know, be that the, the platform would be improved both by additional users uh, giving us more feedback on um, improvements they wanted or, or uh, uh, I think one of them even found a bug once but uh, and uh, HPCC has no bugs <laughs> obviously not but uh, <laughs> An opportunity for improvement, then let's call it that. So, so Richard, uh, did you perceive that realized? Uh, so, it, I do agree 100%, by the way, in the, with the concept of um, open source making code based better and also introducing innovation in, in applications and systems, right? Uh, that is um, always far better than uh, when you have many brains looking at something, uh, you're in a far better position than when you have only a few brains looking at it. Uh, so, But uh, now, 10 years later, uh, do you believe that we realize some of those benefits and that uh, and that it, did, it was worth it? Yes, absolutely. Um, I haven't seen any downside to us having gone open source. Uh, it has been uh, very useful in terms of um, you know, fresh ideas and inputs from from uh, users, um, some contributions from, from uh, outside, uh, including you know, interns uh, that we've found much easier to get involved because we're an open source project. Um, but also just the mindset of being, I mean, even if we hadn't gone open source, then acting as if we had and, and being open source within the company um which is something we've done with other uh, components that we haven't you know absolutely gone open source on but adopting an open source mentality for how it's developed encouraging contributions from within the from within the company at least um has been very beneficial and i think you know just remembering that because it's open source because anybody can use it that we can't make assumptions about Oh well, we don't need to fix this properly because everyone who's using it you know, uses it this way has actually been very good for the quality of the code, I would say. And knowing that your code can be seen uh, you know, discourages any um, any taking of shortcuts and, and and so on. So there's lots of intangible benefits to being a open source, I think. Yeah, and, and and I agree. I agree. So it, and 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 you mentioned there innovation a little bit, and 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 how some of this um, um, change in the way we approach like development and and releases and and code and troubleshooting and all that um, change with open source. Uh, and and you mentioned uh, the introduction of new ideas as well. And um, well, of course, uh, ATO is just out, so I couldn't avoid asking the question. So. Um, what new ideas did we get into ATO? I know that we have done a lot of a big splash on cloud and a lot of work to get HP systems um, a little bit, uh, I wouldn't say completely detached from bare metal because you can still run it in bare metal the same way you ran it before, but more capable to run on, on cloud virtualized environments and, and of course containers. So would you mind get a little bit more information there? Um, well, the, the big change in ATO, the big new feature is that it is designed to operate in a containerized uh, environment, uh, in particular under Kubernetes, and therefore uh, be able to run um, on the cloud in a cloud native fashion. Um, so components can be started and stopped on demand as needed. They can be um, uh, scaled up and down as needed. Um, and they can uh, be, be turned off and not paid for when not needed. So um, that's the, the big um, change that is, is there in ATO. It, it's been possible to run HPCC in the cloud before by you know, setting up a, a bunch of virtual machines and, and installing uh, the platform onto it. But, but this is different. This is you know, really 
you know, taking a full advantage of the cloud capabilities. So uh, and that's that's quite important because um, yes, you're absolutely right. There are many people and organizations running HVC in cloud environments statically, but they probably pay quite a bit more than they should pay. Uh, and it might not run as efficiently either, uh, depending on how they allocate the storage and all that. So we're speaking about storage and, and data and data planes. So I know that uh, some, we introduced some, um, I would say maybe fairly radical ideas on, on how to store data and access data in cloud, right? So, uh, well, uh, different yeah. from what we had before. So. Well, the, the, the big difference really, uh, and, and I mentioned this you know, when I was talking about the birth of HPCC 20 years ago, one of the things we found we could do was use the local storage on our compute nodes to give us very cheap data storage. Um, but that doesn't really work if your compute nodes are ephemeral, as they are in the cloud, if you're wanting to uh, spin up new thaws uh, in uh, response to a new job coming in, for example, or, or um, add additional Roxy nodes when you know that the load's going to be higher. You can't really do the same thing and, and use the local storage because it's it's only there temporarily. Um, so data is moving off the nodes again uh, in the cloud world. Data is going to be stored you know, using whatever the, the cloud supports, um, you know, as your blobs or AWS S3 or uh, any other um, uh, cloud storage system, in particular if it's supportable via uh, NFS, for example, and the POSIX interface, then, then we can uh, access it. Um, but we're not trying to put the data on the nodes anymore. That does give us some challenges on um, Performance because the uh, the data being local was a you know, was part of uh, how Roxy in particular got to be so fast. So we're, we're going to need to be very careful about how we cache data and how much we cache data. Um, we can cache using um, uh, cloud systems like HPC Cache. We can cache using um, Linux level things like FS Cache. Uh, the Linux page cache will help and we'll be caching data within our system as well. Uh, and uh, between all of those and the fact that we can you know, scale up uh, larger more easily, uh, we should be able to um, compensate for the fact that the data isn't actually stored locally, uh, that enough of the working set will, will get local fast enough that uh, that you won't notice. Yeah, and, and and the challenges there, Richard, are slightly different between Roxy and, and Thor, right? You you mentioned Roxy, of course, because Roxy yeah. is latency sensitive. Um, Thor might not be as much, but Thor needs bandwidth, and and perhaps some of the challenges that you yeah. have in the cloud is the fact that um, the amount of bandwidth that you truly get uh, varies. <laughs> so that might have it. Yes, I mean Thor. Even in the data center, it's been quite common for Thor to be reading data that wasn't local. Um, you know, because you've got, because you end up with multiple Thor clusters uh, sharing some data, so you're quite often reading data from one to another. Um, Thor is quite often actually limited by um, by how fast it can read data, but you know the, the cloud systems, you know, they're, they're not slow reading the the data. They 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 are pretty well tuned. It's just it's not quite the same as having a a local SSD, but we'll still uh, for example, when running Thor in the cloud, uh, there will probably still be a local um, SSD uh, disk for each uh, node, and it will be used for uh, spill files, for example. Yeah. And so you, you'll still get some some of that uh, local benefit you know, within the job. So, uh, Richard, uh, and again, uh, because uh, when you start looking at these problems, um, these challenges and you think well this is a relatively simple thing uh, these are only the only factors involved and then when you start doing this you discover that there are a lot of uh, a myriad of uh, small little things quirks or or or, or um, specialties that you need to start looking into uh, to address them as part of the big problem so um tell us a little bit about um some of those quirks i know that packet loss was one of those and particularly um packet loss and 
blocks in place in that using this UDP layer. So I know that you have done quite a bit of work, well, not just you yourself, but uh, the, the group has done a, quite a bit of work to get those addressed as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, in the data center, um, you, you can, and, and we did take the view that you know, the network is under our control. We we hire uh, network uh, engineers that know what they're doing, and we tell them we want a network that is sufficiently specced to not lose packets. And uh, that was the original assumption of Roxy twenty years ago: was that it would not lose packets. Um, it it undertook to not send packets faster than the capacity of the network. And in exchange, it, it uh, required a network that didn't lose packets that it sent. Correct. Um, and that's you know served us reasonably well for well, twenty years in the data center. I think we, it was a reasonable assumption back then. Yeah, uh, I mean we've, we've, we've occasionally caught problems with with lost packets, um, but in the cloud it becomes harder uh, to to make that assumption. Um, that, that your network will not lose packets. Uh, so one of the changes in 8.0 for Roxy is um, th that there is a uh, a change to the UDP protocol that that will um, resend packets that are, haven't been received. Um, it does. I mean, one of the reasons why we didn't uh, put this in um, 20 years ago is is that it does slightly slow things down right. because the, you have to keep um, you know a, a windows worth of packets um, and be prepared to resend them and you can't send you know if you've got a buffer for you know a thousand packets or whatever you can't send packet 1001 until packet one has been confirmed received so but adding there uh, so uh, the decision on using UDP is many times because you want to avoid the overhead of using TCP uh, and as we do these things, I don't be getting closer yeah, yeah. to something that is close to TCP. <laughs> so. No, um, it, it's not that close to TCP. Um, it's also related to the the end to end nature of Roxy that TCP really doesn't work too well with. I mean, yeah, yes, you. If we had TCP packets everywhere, then the sizes, total sizes of all the packet you know, buffers uh, would end up have being too big for memory on our original machines. Um, yeah, yeah. Hey, um, and how about security? I know that uh, also we have done quite a bit of work around security because um, in the old model, you could say, well, I built uh, thick walls around it and um, and we uh, consider the the uh, unit Roxy for whatever it is uh, as a secure environment, right? And, and yeah. as, a, as a single appliance. But but the cloud um, destroys that paradigm, right? Uh, pretty much makes every component right. inside available in some way, potentially externally, or or or, or become it, a pivot or an attack. I mean, we we have yeah you know, the the containerized uh, system uh, lends itself to a zero trust model where you know, you're, you're not you know, nobody has you know, root access to the. To the containers, you, know, you you can't log in and reconfigure them. If you want a, a different configuration, you, you start a new system. Um, so you know, the, the the model of, of zero touch on on the um, on the pods helps mitigate some of that. But you know, yeah, yes, we're a little bit more nervous about who might be sniffing the wire uh, in the cloud um, compared to the data center. Um, so we have done some work, for example, in Roxy, we have the ability to set a flag to say all, all of the UDP traffic in both directions between uh, servers and agents uh, can be encrypted. Uh, in Thor, we have the ability for using uh, TLS for all of the um, TCP traffic within the cluster um, or for any traffic between Thor and, and Dali. We have always had the ability, well, not always, but for a very long time, we've had the ability for um, encrypting all traffic into ESP, for example. So uh, you can encrypt uh, pretty much everything uh, in the, that is passing over the wire um, as of 8.0. Very good. Very good. 
Yeah, that's quite exciting. We, we, um, I think we have so many things out there, and, you, and I, I always want to encourage people to try the new versions as soon as they are out. I understand that because uh, there is a period of time for stabilization, you, um, you want to not put the, perhaps the, the 8.0 version or the, the, the dot zero version in production and, and, and fully trust it for all of your critical loads, but, um, but there are so many new features that it really uh, makes it very compelling to at least give it a try and, and shake out the initial issues and, and and then potentially move it to production as well, right? Uh, and 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 in ATO there weren't that many changes that affected um, our bare metal environments, right? So it or, or does it? So if someone yeah. had the uh, HP system deployed on bare metal and they want to move to ATO, is there a compelling reason for them to do that? There are some compelling reasons, yes. Um, in particular, uh, what I just mentioned on, on Roxy with the uh, lost packet support, that is of benefit for uh, bare metal users. But at the same time as that, we we had some fairly significant performance improvements in the oh. uh, in the Roxy, um, both on the um, the UDP protocol performance, but also the uh, the index reading. Uh, we we moved some bottlenecks. So I think you'll see some performance improvements there. You'll see some performance improvements in Thor. Um, the encryption in transit is available for bare metal as well. If, if people, uh, if, if that's something that's important to them, um, there are uh, improvements coming uh, in the ECL watch uh, interface that will be there for bare metal as well. Uh, that's probably for eight two rather than eight oh. Uh, but yes, I mean our bare metal users will will certainly find things to be um, interested in in, in the ATO. Very good. So isn't one of them. That's a, that's yet another reason to to move and at least test it, even if you use bare metal. So um, Richard, I know that you and the team have their hands full on on all of these. Uh, eight just released ATO and all of the features that you want to introduce for ATO. But what do you think comes next? What will be the next thing after a ATO will stabilize relatively soon and uh, we'll have a production ready release and eventually we'll have the, the remaining uh, cloud friendly features in A2. Uh, but, but down the road, uh, what do you think, what would you want to get in a 9 all release? Um, I think there's, there's still quite a lot of opportunities for um, some fairly significant performance work. Um, there's um, a lot of uh, sort of connectivity, if you like, um, or, or inter interoperability, making it easier to uh, read data from different file formats or, or write data to different file formats so that you can do part of your processing in HPCC and part in, in Spark or, or whatever, for example. Um, those are the sort of biggest areas I, I think that uh, are likely to, to come in the next 12 months or so. Wow, yes. Well, <laughs> thinking that, uh, that there are still uh, quite a bit of, there's still quite a bit of work going into all of the cloud and all uh, the 8 or 8 2 release, um, it may be a little bit more than a year, I don't know, maybe it's a year. I, I well. <laughs> Some things will be available in the next year, but uh, um, it, it, it's an ongoing project. We're, we're, yes, of course. I, I, I can't see us being done anytime soon. No, uh, and I, I don't even think it will ever be done. So if you ask, uh, I don't know, me if, or you, uh, in 2005, if it was done, it wasn't done. In 2010, it wasn't done. In 2015, it wasn't done. And we are talking about 20 years later. And, uh, no, it will, I don't think it will ever be done. It continues to evolve, and uh, and, yeah. and, uh, and it's organic. It, it, I, I see it, uh, HPC evolving based on um, how technology evolves. So uh, adapting uh, and sometimes anticipating uh, new technologies. So it's it's very cool. Yeah. So Richard, this has been a great conversation. I don't want to make this too long. I don't want people to get. Uh, <laughs> stuck for an hour here. So typically we try to keep this uh, about 20, 25 minutes. Uh, I think uh, we did a little bit more today, but this was a great and exciting conversation. And I uh, really look forward to taking a look at A2 and 
Now you know when it comes out. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll let you know when it's ready. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you very much and and, and uh, happy birthday, HP system. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> See you.